Good morning, Bridge family. Would you pray with me as we begin? Lord, I come to you now and on behalf of the people that I get to serve and those that may be joining us from all around the world, I ask you, Lord, on our behalf to join us, to refine each person within the sound of my voice, starting with me. Lord, may we grow in our ability to bring you glory and as ambassadors of your grace and your gospel. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, friends, let me ask you a question this morning as we begin. Have you ever personally struggled with paying attention? Now, for some of you, I'm going to need to ask that question again just to prove the point. But think about it. Have you ever personally struggled with paying attention. Now, if, like most of us, you can say honestly, well, yes, yes, I have. Uh, in fact, I'm struggling right now, Pastor Jeff. Let me ask you, what have you found to be your best remedies for paying attention? I think back to my time in the military and the army taught me to, to stand up, to, to, if need be, get on your feet. It's very difficult to drift because you may fall down. I've sat on my hands at times. I've bitten the insides of my cheek to try to stay awake and, and fight off the, the drowsiness at times when I've known great fatigue. How about for you? What have you found to be the best remedy for paying attention when you might honestly struggle with drifting off? Well, you may be surprised to know that God actually has a plan and a way to help you to pay attention, at least in the context of your walk with Him. And if you've been with us, you know that in the recent weeks, we've looked at Hebrews chapter 2 in the opening verses, where we've been warned to pay much closer attention, to listen much more carefully, lest we drift away from God and His truth and His love. And so let me just tell you the message of uh, the title of our message this morning as we get ready to look at Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 9. And in the title of the sermon, I think you'll find that it answers the question, it, it shows the relevancy. To my opening and it will also give you a light in terms of where we're going this morning. My sermon today is entitled Gospel Shifting from Godless Drifting. Gospel Shifting from Godless Drifting. Now I'll take you into the immediate context of Hebrews chapter 2 in just a moment but first let me remind you of the broader context that we find ourselves in. Here at the bridge and amongst our family, we've dedicated 2018 to the year of reverence, where we would have an unapologetic commitment and advancement of our family's awe and healthy fear of God in a loving worship-filled context. And that was embellished and growing out of our commitment to walk through the book of Hebrews, the book of Leviticus, and later this year, the book of Amos. And so let me just remind you, when we looked at the book of Leviticus, we did it after cracking open Hebrews and then saying literally after the first four verses, time out. Let's go to Leviticus, because in Leviticus, we'll gain a much greater understanding of what we're going to see and hear and learn from the book of Hebrews. And when we went through, verse by verse, the entire book of Leviticus earlier this year, we came to what many people believe to be a list of laws. And we said, no, this is not a list of laws. This is a love letter from a redeeming God to a rebellious people. We saw that God wanted his people to have a way to come back into restoration and relationship with him, even though, like us, they were prone to wander. They repeatedly let the Lord down and proved over and over and over again, like us, 
that they were not worthy of all that our God would give them, just like us. And yet the love of our God made a way for rebellious people to come back to restoration in him. And then we said, okay, now that we get this, the holiness of God, where we saw over and over and over again, over 50 times in Leviticus, be holy, be holy, be holy for the Lord your God is holy. We said, okay, we get it. God wants his people to be holy. And from there, we came back into Hebrews and we saw in chapter one, an opening that repeated to us that God speaks, God speaks. He spoke long ago to his people through his prophets, but he spoke in the New Testament times through his son, Jesus the Christ. And we noted that he speaks to us today, still through his word, which is Jesus, his word, which is the Holy Scriptures, his spirit who affirms and guides us through his people, that God speaks. And then we saw in the remainder of chapter one that God wants everyone to know that Jesus is better than the angels and everything and anything else. But I wanna bring you back to this, this foundational point that God speaks. Because as we get ready to go into his word today, I wonder if you're ready to listen. Have you got the heart that says, I want to, I want to hear from God. I'm ready to listen. I'm no longer looking for loopholes. I don't want the lukewarm world. I want to listen and follow. I want to pray and obey. I, I want to be who our Lord has called and created me to be. Is that you, friend? Because I promise you that if you come, at least here, I know because I'm going to share with you God's word. And I know his spirit is in me and is speaking through me. And so I ask you, do you want to listen to the Lord? Do you want to walk with him? I mean, do you want to? Do you want to? I want to open this morning now with just a, a calibrator, just, just a, a warm up to get our hearts ready. A reminder that if and when we really want to walk with the Lord and we're willing to listen, we will hear the God who speaks if we'll quiet our hearts and give him the stage of our lives. Watch this and then we'll pick right back up and I pray bless you in a way that I, I suspect for many, you're gonna be shocked and surprised in a beautiful way today as God's word no doubt will blossom right before you and I pray in you. Watch this and listen much more carefully. Speak, Lord, I am listening. For so long I've wanted to say my own things, journals of agendas, prose of my own possibilities. For so long I've wanted my words to promote the things that I love the most and my treasure chest have become storage closets of trophies of me, collecting my accomplishments, brushing the dust on top of them, placing them on my front room shelves for everyone to see. And when I was on the stage, I did the same thing, saying the statements I knew would be impressive, speaking in rhythms that were faster than flash, though no one could understand them, pushing my plans, my ideas, my calendars of what I thought you wanted, or at least I hope that even if you didn't, I could get away with it. And for too long, I lived like this. Speak, Lord, I am listening, because now I see that when you weren't my definition, my words meant nothing. Now I see that if your spirit doesn't fill our words, we're giving vessels to a thirsty world that look beautiful but are empty. Now I see that when I was without you, it wasn't pretty. I remember the sin you saved me from, the pits of hell you pulled me from, and I have not come far just to let pride take over me. I rebuke my need to be an exhibition. May my only ambition be to be like you and thus experience life the way you created me to in an image less like me in a portrait more like you. May this horizontal stage never 
be a vertical barricade. May nothing in this world separate from the joy of knowing you. I turn down the chaos of my life to stop and to listen, to return to my first love, to hear the truth in your language. Only you can breathe new life into these dead pages. You speak all type. How can my days tell your story? You speak all Powerful testimony to listening to our Lord. Oh, I pray that's your heart's desire. Let, let me just pick back up where we had left off and just remind you of our context. Again, we're coming now into Hebrews chapter 2, where we've been warned that we need to listen much more carefully so that we don't drift away. And we were reminded last week that we have no excuses, none that God himself has spoken his truth and his love, his gospel and his expectations upon his people. His people have been sent to affirm that which God has said. God tells us and has already shown us that through signs and wonders and various miracles, he's affirmed what he said, that Jesus is Lord and that he is to be faithfully followed. We saw that he has even given spiritual gifts to his people to again attest to and affirm that Jesus is Lord and he is to be followed no matter what. Well, I said to you last week that when you look at Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, that I felt that that passage kind of encapsulated and paralleled the message in the three chapters of the book of Titus. And in Titus, we saw that in chapter 1, you could summarize it this way, be real. We saw real, a real portrait of a lover of God in Paul. We saw a real portrait of the leaders of God in how Paul described those that were to lead. And we saw a real portrait of the liars who work against God, those who claim to be a follower, but whose lives prove that they're liars. In fact, God's word was so bold, it said to us, listen, these are detestable people worth nothing at all. Then we got to chapter 2 and we saw that it's all about being righteous and it's about love. It was about definitions and discipleship and the declaration of God's truth and love. We got to chapter 3 and we saw that it's about the warfare, to be ready for the warfare. And we noted that the way that you be ready is through the reminding, the reinforcement, and the remembering. And it's from that place that I want to pick up today because, you see, when you look at God's plan and his way to shift from the drift, gospel shifting from godless drifting, it again parallels Titus chapter 3. It's going to involve reminding reinforcing and remembering. And for our time together today, we're going to focus on the reminding. Next week, we'll pick up with the reinforcing and the remembering. But today, we're just going to concentrate in verses 5 through 9 of Hebrews 2 on that which is the reminding. Now, let me just tell you that in the reminding, what we'll see in this passage is that there are five components to gospel reminding, to gospel shifting that will take us away from godless drifting. Those five reminders are, number one, to be reminded of God's providential plan. Number two, to be reminded of God's Psalm 8 perspective. Number three, to be reminded that God's people are a purposed people. Number four is to be reminded that we live in the context of a paradoxical 
perplexing problem. And finally, number five, when we get to verse nine, you'll see that we need to be reminded of our Prince of Peace, praise God. So with that said, let's go ahead and open up. If you've got your Bibles, come with me to Hebrews chapter two, verses five through nine. First thing that we need to recognize if we're going to shift from the drift is that there is a providential plan. Let me share it with you. Uh, Again, God's word, Hebrews two, verse five. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are proclaiming. Now, I know it doesn't jump off the page, but if you'll press in and read the Bible more carefully, what you'll see here is that God has a plan. It's God's providential plan, and the people of God are proclaiming God's providential plan. This word for, it's linking the purposes that are to follow with the particulars that have just been. You want to know how it is that we prevent the drift? We are reminded of God's plan. Now this plan, it again, it shows that God had Jesus come and that he's going to always be who he is and that he's always better than the angels. Not to confuse his value and his worth with his assignment down on earth. You see, God has a plan. It says that God subjected this. That means he has a plan and he's in control. It's a providential plan. And we're told that this is what the writer of Hebrews is speaking of. He says, quote, of which we are speaking. You see, God has continuously and consistently spoken his plan. And the people of God, we know his plan. We proclaim his plan. We obey his plan. And ultimately, we are his plan, church. That God has a plan. It's Christ and his church. We are plan A and there is no plan B. This has been from the beginning and this is how it will always be until Christ returns. Now, let me give you a little better perspective on that plan. As we go to verse 6, we're going to see God's Psalm 8 perspective. Here's the word. It has been testified somewhere. This is the beginning of Hebrews 2, verse 6. It has been testified somewhere. Well, let me just take a breather here and tell you that somewhere, it's Psalm 8. We're about to quote Psalm 8, verses 4, 5, and 6. Now get this, and and, and listen carefully. What we're about to see in Hebrews 2 is a quote from Psalm 8 that is the Bible's own commentary on Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Let me say that again. The author of Hebrews is going to quote Psalm 8 that David wrote, which is David's commentary on Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now you need to track with that because what you're about to learn from many of you is going to be revelatory. And I pray it's going to bless you huge. You see, here it is. It has been testified somewhere, quote, What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? Now here the word man means humanity. It's referencing Adam, but in the context of representing all of humanity. And even the, quote, son of man is another way of describing humanity. Now, this is important because for many of us, we are assuming when we read this that it's speaking of Jesus. But Jesus is not going to be the focus until we get to verse 9. That's very important because you're about to learn some things about our assignment in Christ as Christians, that's going to blow you away. So what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? See God's passion for his people. And I pray that you and I will embrace before we unpack this, that if God has a passion for his people, so should we. Now I want to share with you another clip here. And for some of you, Uh, I sent it out earlier in the week, and you may be familiar with it, but many of you no doubt are not. I just want to share with you a family portrait. 
I, I want to share with you what the passion of God for his people looks like when reflected beautifully back by the people of God. I just want you to listen very carefully. This is our brother Edward in Uganda. He recorded this a little over a week ago on the morning of my departure, and it's now airing on hisbridgeradio.com, just as a testimony to what the Lord is doing in our family. But I think it's a beautiful portrait of what the love of God for his people looks like through a loving people of God. Listen to Edward. I pray it touches your heart, and then we'll pick right back up. Hello, brothers and sisters. It's me, Edward, uh, your brother in Christ Jesus. I'm here to share with you all the things that God has done during the time that we have spent with our brother, Pastor Jeff. Uh, first of all, I want to thank God for everything for he has kept us alive and he has blessed us with so many blessings. Uh, with our time, we have had two sisters being baptized. Uh, we have learned a lot of things. I've learned a lot. God has used this time to bless us, to open our eyes and ears, and our hearts are now changing and changing always. We thank the Lord for this blessed time, and we pray that he continue to bless us and change our lives through his grace and mercies in our Lord. Uh, we have seen so many things that the Lord has done, have made so many people. We have learned a lot of things and hoping that they will continue to bless us and He will continue to change our lives through all the things that we have learned, through His words. Uh, we thank Him always and we pray that He continues uh, to change people in different parts of the world. <clears throat> and this message goes to everyone to be aware that Jesus Christ is alive. He is doing things in the world. He is changing people's lives. He is helping us also to grow more and more every time. And we are praising him having hope in him because we always see new things new things comes in our lives and we learn and we hope to always continue and continue to see his grace moving in us and around the world so we pray uh, that he guide us in the unity that we are seeking to be one in Christ and uh, this time has uh, showed us that we need to be one in Christ as one family as his prayer always in John chapter 17 to be united by his love so we have seen his his hand moving in us and we continue and we pray always to be blessed. So I thank you for listening to me. And I thank God for our brother, Pastor Jeff, for the time he gave us to be with us. He sacrificed a lot. And we pray that it continue to be like this in coming time. Always we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I can tell you as one who has just recently returned from being with Edward and our family in Uganda, what you heard in word was genuinely coming from his heart. And this is a reflection of the heart of God for his people. Listen, in this verse, again, quoting from Psalm 8, this is God speaking to the blessing that humanity has 
especially those of us that are walking with the King, that are submitted to the Lordship of Christ, that want to be the people of God who are showing the world that He is alive. Just think about it. This, this is perhaps one of the most beautiful portraits of God's miraculous mercy and amazing grace in all the Bible. This is God's word saying, God is treating us so well. He's thinking and caring about us so incredibly. And I mean, think about it. We're the wretches who are receiving royalty. I, I think of it this way, that if, if God were having a great picnic, an eternal picnic, we're the mosquitoes that are at his picnic, and yet he loves us and cares for us. This should put us in awe. Again, you want to know how you shift from the drift? You worship. You realize just what we have as children of God, if in fact you are a child of God. Now, this again brings into light the fact that we are, we are a purposed people. This Psalm 8 perspective, wait till you see what comes. He says in verse 7, quote, You made him, now remember this is humanity, you God made him humanity for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him, or humanity, us, with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection to humanity's feet, or under humanity's feet. Now, I know some of you are going to say, no, 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 that's not us, that, that's, that's Jesus. No, Jesus is coming in verse 9. And just so you know, this is, again, Psalm 8, reflecting on and unpacking Genesis 1, the blessing that we have, that God has given us a royalty in his family as priests. And this is what you're going to see, is that the reason why we get to rule and have royalty in our blood is so that we can serve as the priests, those that come between others and the Lord and bring them to him. Listen to Genesis 1, verses 26, 27, and 28. Because if you think that I'm crazy here, saying that all this high language is pointed at humanity, listen to Genesis 1, verse 26 through 28. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them, humanity, rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and subdue it. Subdue the earth and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. We, friends, as human beings made in the image of God, have been given the purpose from day one, literally, in our design and in our DNA, to subdue the earth and to rule over it. L. Michael Morales has said, and I quote, The Great Commission begins before humanity's fall away from communion with God. On the sixth day of creation in Genesis 1, man was commissioned by God to fill and subdue the earth and rule over the creatures. Accordingly, one might justly define the Great Commission as ruling and subduing the earth and its creatures. The Great Commission bestowed upon Adam entailed that his kingship, Adam's kingship, would be in the service of his priestly office, namely that Adam would rule and subdue for the sake of gathering all creation to the Creator's footstool in worship. The Sabbath consummation was the heart and goal of the sixth day's commission." End quote. You see, we saw a few months ago that this opening in Genesis, what the first words that humans heard from God brought blessing in and through obedience. 
Well, now I want you to see that the blessing in the obedience was in the fulfilling of the Great Commission. Day six, Adam is commissioned to go and subdue the earth, bring to the earth the goodness of our God, that all on the earth would come to the goodness of our God to worship him. This is the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. Find the lost, grow the found, bring the world to worship our King. Oh, amen and amen. Now, I doubt that many have acknowledged or seen in the past that the Great Commission begins here in Genesis 1, day 6 of creation. We have the Great Commission. We have the blessing bestowed upon us in the midst of our obedience obedience to fulfilling the Great Commission. Friends, this is who we are. You want to shift from the drift? Then worship and witness and work for the glory of God. Oh, what a blessed people we are. Now that brings us to our perplexing problem. And you'll find this as verse 8 continues. The scripture says, now in putting everything in subjection to him, and again, this is still humanity. This is still us. Now in putting everything in subjection to humanity, God left nothing outside our control. That means we have no excuses, that everything is our responsibility. And yet, here's the second half of the verse, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him or humanity. This is commentary on the fact that we live in a broken and fallen world. And you see, friends, humanity didn't just fall. Humanity is still actively free falling further and further into sin and further and further away in separation from our God. This is why the Great Commission is so urgent. People are literally dying and going to hell. And we have been given the call to subdue the earth, to go and make disciples, to proclaim the gospel to all of creation. This is why we've been saved. We've been saved to serve, to live sent, to be the set-apart people of God who live with a homothumadon, supernatural, riotously passionate purpose in our oneness for the glory of God. Oh, friends, I pray that you will see that he is worth it. Our God is worth it. You know, it, it was the first Adam who plunged humanity into sin and death. But it's Jesus, the second Adam, who plunged himself into death for sinful humanity. This is why we get to be his ambassadors. Just think about it. There are so many who who are living complacently, claiming Christ, but denying him with their lives. I mean, think about it. I, I did a, just a little bit of research. And right now on the planet, it's assumed that there are approximately 3 billion people that have not yet heard the gospel. Approximately 40% of the people groups on the planet are unreached people groups. In North America alone, it is assumed that there are approximately 350 unreached, unengaged people groups living in our cities for the most part. 350 unreached, unengaged people groups. You see, you don't have to go to a faraway continent. You don't have to go to another country. You don't have to, in many cases, go across a state or a county. But please... Don't tell me that you don't have to go. Every one of us has been called to fulfill the Great Commission, to go and subdue the earth for the glory of God. And if you can't go physically, I know that you can go prayerfully. Every one of us has been called to go. It's a 100% participation proclamation and declaration that this commission is calling us to. Oh, friends, I was staggered, staggered to find that Barna, the Barna Group, has researched and would tell you that today, in mainline North American churches, over 50% of the people in church do not know and have not heard of the Great Commission. Over 80% would say, even if I've heard of it, I don't really know what it is. 
only 17% of those that are in church would profess to know what the Great Commission is and could tell you a little bit about it. Is it any wonder that we're seeing not only our culture, but the church culture crumble? That which we've been given as our primary purpose and way to bring glory to God is not known by the overwhelming majority of people that claim to be Christians. And in, when you look at it generationally, those that uh, are demographically described as the elders, only 29% in church would be able to tell you what the Great Commission is. That means over 7 out of 10 of our older, most mature saints don't have a clue what the Great Commission is. Amongst the baby boomers, it's 3 out of 4 have no idea. 25% is what's limited to those who actually know what the Great Commission is. You go to the Gen Xers and it's down to only 17%. That means over 80% of the Gen Xers have no idea. Those in church, over 80% don't know what the Great Commission is. And when you talk about millennials, the number is up to 9 out of 10 have no idea. 9 out of 10 millennials in church do not know what the Great Commission is. Well, friends, we have an epidemic, a spiritual epidemic of complacency of what some would call comfortable or lukewarm Christians. This idea that you can be a carnal Christian, that's an oxymoron. That's like me telling you that this, this item here is both hot and cold. Just because I say it doesn't mean it's so. And if it can't be, it can't be. And to claim to be a child of God, a follower of Christ, someone spirit-filled, to have the faith but not be faithful, that's just a lie. That's just a lie, and the Bible says it over and over and over again. I, I want to offer you another video, and, and I pray this too will bless you. As you see the heart of another young lady who, who I think God has worked in powerfully, and I pray will work through powerfully. Watch this, and then we'll come back and we'll close. Amen. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith would be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust Why do we constantly sing songs we don't believe in? Is it because it's easier to hear our own voices than the voice of the Father calling those lyrics to life? Because goosebumps and tears and shivers down your spine are not exactly examples of the wonders and signs that Christ was talking about. Keep in mind that Jesus said, greater works you will do. But a lot of us are content with less than an hour spent in his presence, yet we expect him to come through with miracles. Now, how does that add up? I'm not much of a mathematician, but if I had a dime for every time that didn't make sense, I'd be more than comfortable. But that's the problem, isn't it? We're comfortable Christians, scared to step out in faith, so we put our spirituality under strict lock and key and mark our hearts with signs that read, no trespassing, so we cling to the comfort of our own authority subconsciously. We give God preference and conditions as to where we would like to be used and refuse to act on anything outside of our norm, so we're stuck. Stuck somewhere between wanting to be transformed and uh, borderline lukewarm. So the preference is to be low key, to put the mini in ministry and minimize the work of Christ. We complain about not seeing him move in our lives and we're so quick to submerge ourselves in a dry season when all we have to do is consistently pray and patiently wait for God to water our walks with a downpour of rain. But wait, words like patience and consistence and commitment make us twitch. We itch for those blessings but can't even commit to five minutes in our prayer closet, but yet we want the fruit of our labor. But what is fruit without labor? The harvest is plenty, but where are the laborers? We're lazy. We want blessings to fall in our laps, perhaps. 
See, when you're comfortable, you become vulnerable to every spiritual attack. It's open season on your salvation and the devil ain't gonna hold back. He'll have you thinking procrastination is just a bad habit when really it's a tactic used to get you distracted from the time you're meant to spend with God. So the enemy prays and stalks the earth with stagnant hearts. And you immediately become prey when you find less time to pray exposing your innermost vulnerable parts. Let me put it this way. The comfortable Christian believes in the God who gave Mary and Joseph a place to lie in, but not the God who delivered Daniel from the mouths of lions. The comfortable Christian relies heavily on prayer when it's convenient, but when it's time to actually convene for prayer, suddenly they're lenient. The comfortable Christian is so eager to receive a big blessing, but when it comes to the testing of his faith, he retreats to a place of familiarity because he believes that salvation is a guarantee of no suffering, but even Jesus knew that that wasn't true. The son of man needs a permanent house, not a vacation home. But it looks like you've made a home out of your comfort zone. You've built up fences of pretenses that everything is all right. Your heart is confined, suffocated by the fear of having to change or being left behind. So you take hold of what you know, never desiring to be called out into the water and out of your comfortable little boat because you're scared. When you think about Peter, you're not focused on the fact that he had enough faith to defy nature, no. You're focused on the part where he almost drowned in front of the Savior. That fear of failure puts an end to any desire to grow. Spiritual paralysis is the catalyst that declines the desire to know God for who he is. Because when he sees you, he doesn't see you for who you are, but rather who he's called you to be. So when he says, draw near to me, Expect to be in a place of discomfort. Growing pains are never pleasant, but it's evident that you've grown. The aching knees of maturity are bearing seeds of faith that you've sown. He's known to break down every overbearing wall of Jericho, so let it go. Let it go. Your comfort zone is your danger zone, and the morning signs become less noticeable when you settle down in your spirit and become more comfortable. So it's time to stop being your own stumbling block. Stop trying to fit such a big God into a small box. They already tried that. <laughs> yeah, they tried to fit him on the cross, but still he managed to break free from those locks. So here's the solution, and the solution is simple. When Jesus called Peter out into the water. When Jesus called Peter out a little farther, he knew he'd be surrounded by clouds of doubt. But the thing is, Jesus also knew that if Peter fell, he'd be the first one to reach out so that we could be the outreach of his word. Closed mouths don't get fed, so let your voice be heard. Why is it so easy to speak out on opinions, but when it comes to defending scripture from the one who gave us dominion, we're mute. God did not give us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. These are the ingredients for the food for your soul. The perfect concoction for conviction just to let you know that comfort can be a hindrance in disguise. So be wise whenever you find your spirit laid back. Because in fact, there is always work to be done for the good of the kingdom until the glorious day that thy kingdom come. Amen. Amen. Wow, what a powerful ministry that young lady has. I don't know if it did the same to you, but it took me a little off guard and, and I thank God for it because it calibrated me when it did that. But let me take you to the great calibrator and that is God and his word. And, and I know it may seem as though we live in a fallen, broken world and, and this thing's out of control, but make no mistake, our sovereign Lord is our loving solution. Our one true sovereign is the one true solution, and his name is Jesus. And now let me show you as the scriptures turn to him, ultimately, how do we shift from drifting? We put our focus in our lives into the hands and the heart of our Lord Jesus the Christ. Listen now to Hebrews 2, uh, chapter 2, verse 9, arguably one of the most pregnant verses in all the Bible. In fact, I had intended to take us through to the end of chapter 2 today, but I just couldn't. I could not put Hebrews 2 verse 9 in the middle of a message. This is an exclamation mark if there ever was one. Listen to our Lord's description here. But we, this is the Prince of Peace, but we see him. Now let me just stop there for a minute and I have to ask you, friends. Do you see him? Do you see him? That's how you stop drifting. 
you put your focus and you put your faith and you begin to follow him. It says here, but we see him. Do you see him? And if you see him, what happens in response? Because I know most people in church will say, oh, I see him. And I think they're lying because I don't see them living and I don't see them loving. And let me tell you, if you see him, you will praise him and you will obey him. You will faithfully follow him. I mean, when you see him with the eyes of your heart, not just some kind of acknowledgement of his reality, but I mean a loving set of eyes that says, I want to, I want to follow you, Jesus. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus. So here, now this is how we know that earlier we were talking about Adam or humanity. Because now the author says, now I'm talking about Jesus, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Friends, this verse is the gospel. This verse is the gospel. Do you see him? Do you see the gospel? Will you be the gospel? I ask you, do you see here the 12 distinctions that are worthy of our reminding and that represent our reinforcement of the gospel? Do you see here his incarnation? For a little while he was made to come down lower than the angels and be amongst us. Do you see here the name that is above all names? His name, namely, is Jesus. Do you see here his deity? He was crowned with what? Glory and honor. Do you see his glory? Do you see his honor, his worth, his distinction? Do you see his suffering? And not all suffering leads to death, but his suffering led to death. So you see here his crucifixion. You see here his passion, his humiliation, and by inference, his resurrection, the proof that he is the king. You see here his intentionality. I love the fact that it says, so that. You see, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us so that you see his grace, his amazing grace, the unmerited favor. He did this for the demonstration and the application of his grace and his love. He died for us. There's no greater definition or description of love than laying down your life for another. And especially when you lay down your life for those who are yet sinners, those who are literally still working and fighting against you. Do you see his substitutionary atonement? All of this was for you and me, Christian. Do you want to know how to shift from the drift? Get your eyes and your heart back on Jesus and be reminded of who he is and what he has done. Oh, I pray that you and I would have lives that are defined by Christ. Are you literally living a life that is defined by Christ? If you are, you won't struggle with drifting near as much as those who continue to fight to be the Lord of their own lives. Oh, friends, I want to give you a song that's intentionally here to give you a time to contemplate what you've heard. I pray that right now God himself is just plunging into your heart, calling you to a place of calibration. And for some of you, no doubt, it's going to be a call to repent and believe for the first time that your eternity could change and that your adoption papers would be processed in heaven here today. And I also have no doubt that for others of you who are children of God, but who have been drifting, that this will be a call back, back home into the bosom of our dad, a, a call to arms for some of you who have been complacent on the sidelines. I pray that whatever the message is, that as God speaks to you, that you'll embrace the invitation to let your life be defined by him and that you in turn would then praise him 
because if you truly see him, you will praise him and obey him. Take this time to pray. Let the words of the song penetrate your heart. And we'll come back and we'll close with prayer. Amen.
reason for the cosmos and the picture that it paints of an artist so brilliant he can scarcely be defined, praise him. For the first time that you pause to notice the open sky and wondered what kind of imagination could inspire such beautiful things from scratch, praise him for the scratch, for dust held in the hands of a master craftsman, unafraid to share his likeness with those he knew would break his heart and test his patience and try his love. Praise him for the borrowed breath that you breathe and faculties that function so as to remind you that you are not your own for a love that finds its way to you in every season, letting you know that you are not alone. Praise him remembering never to forget all of his benefits too numerous to be calculated too heavy to be weighed on scales too astronomical to be quantified praise him for the miracles that your eyes have seen that you are too hard-hearted to believe too nearsighted to perceive and too self-sufficient to receive and still somehow he met all of your needs praise him for broken hearts and bruised knees, for mountains brought low and valleys raised for joy, given in the deep of night. Praise him for the night and weeping that always expires and lasts only as long as he allows. Come on, praise him for all that he allows, all that he permits, all that he prevents and all that he allows. Praise him for blessings often overlooked because they're disguised. Praise him for Jesus who brought the radiance of the sun in the tyranny of an unrelenting dark night and before you were even awake to the world you gloried in his light warmed by the generosity of his love carried from death to life on the wings of faith remember your name uttered in a prayer and your heart awakened to your need for a savior remember your savior who showed up at just the right time to show humanity that God would never turn his back on the world that he made. Praise him for the way that he came. Matchless power contained in the frame of a child born in a city as obscure as they come. The giver of life filling up his very own lungs with the same breath that we breathe to show that he is not ashamed of us. He is well acquainted with us. He is committed no matter what the cost to saving us. Praise him for saving us and the cross that provided the means, the door through which we enter, the shade under which we rest, his righteousness and not our own, his grace and his grace alone, calling us out and bringing us in, conquering death and absolving our sin. Let me say it again, praise him in the season that you're in, for it bears the mark of his hold on you. And when life gets a hold of you, tempting you to forget, Lift your eyes, lift your heart, lift your hands, and praise Him. Wow. Amen and amen. Praise Him, Lord. Praise the Lord if you are a lover of our King. Oh, friends, I pray that you will praise Him by being Acts 1.8, that you will praise him by being defined in Christ and by Christ, that you will be Acts 2, that you will be Ephesians 2, Ephesians 4, Ephesians 6. I pray that you'll be Romans 1.16, that you'll be Romans 3, that you'll be Romans 8. I pray that you'll be Jude verses 3, 4, and 5. I pray that you'll be the Beatitudes, that you'll be the fruit of the Spirit. I pray that you will be a minister of reconciliation, that you'll be an ambassador of Christ, that you'll be the aroma of Christ, that you'll be the light of the world, that you'll be a fisher of men, that you'll be a cross-carrying disciple, that you will be be all that Christ has called and created you to be, that you will be a lover of God, that you will be a servant who serves the least of these, that you'll be a lover of people, both brothers and future potential brothers in Christ. I pray that you will be Titus 2.15, 
that you will declare these things, that you will exhort and rebuke with all authority, and that you will allow no one to disregard you. This is how you shift from the drift. This is gospel shifting from godless drifting. You see, friends, what you do is you work and you witness and you worship our Lord as you learn and as you live and as you love like Christ, all for his glory and all by his grace. This is the plan of God for the people of God. Oh, that we would heed the loving word of Hebrews and that we would be the very people of God. Oh Lord, I pray that you will use this time and that your word will be plunged deep into the heart and into the lives of those who have heard, that your spirit will guide us, that your love will define us, and that your truth will protect us and be proclaimed by us all again for your glory, and all and always by your grace. Oh, what a humble, thankful, blessed people we are. We give you our praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.